Guo. My name is David Peterson, and this is The Art of Language Invention. Episode 16, Yes-No Questions. Edward Vidoc sent me a question about uh, questions, uh, that is, uh, how to form questions in a language. Uh, the first thing that you have to know is that there are two different types of major questions. One is WH questions, and the other is yes-no questions. Today we're going to be focusing on yes-no questions, which are so called because when you ask them, they usually call for a response of yes or no. Uh, so for example, if you were to ask me, um, you know, do I give fish to my flowers? The answer, of course, is yes, uh, because that's the appropriate thing to do with fish and flowers. Uh, so that's what a yes-no question is. There are a number of different ways to form yes-no questions in languages, and so you have some options as a language creator in deciding how you want to do yes-no questions in your conlang. The first type of strategy is inversion, which you should be familiar with from English, but also languages like uh, German or uh, French uh, does it. A bunch of languages do this. Essentially, it's uh, taking the, the main verb or an auxiliary and inverting it, it inverting its order with the subject. Um, this is common in languages with uh, VO word order, not so much with OV word order. Um, anyway, and an example is just, uh, I don't know, anything from English. So something like, um, uh, I am wearing glasses is a statement. The accompanying yes, no question would be, am I wearing glasses? So you take the, uh, the verb, in this case, the auxiliary, which comes after the subject, you flip it, or I guess since you're watching this, I guess it would be mirrored. So wait. Yeah, like that. <laughs> All right, anyway, so you flip them, and suddenly a statement becomes a question. Uh, like I said, very common in VO languages. The Austronesian languages do this a lot. Um, it's kind of a toss-up about, uh, usually it's the main verb that gets flipped with the subject, not an auxiliary. Um, we just are, we just see it commonly in English, and I think also German. Um, you still, I know. Yeah, I think you do it in German. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kannst uh, du Deutsch sprechen? Yes, of course. Yeah, boom. All right. Uh, ox, ox inversion in German as well. Um, anyway, so um, that is one strategy, but there are others. The next strategy is a question particle. Question particles are very common in OV languages, though they are not unheard of in VO languages. In fact, the two I'm going to give you, in fact, are, are VO languages. Um, this question particle shows up either as its own word or as some sort of a clitic. It could be a protoclitic, an enclitic, it usually attaches to either the first word of the sentence, if it's going to attach, or to the main verb. So um, Finnish is an example of a language that has a, an enclitic that attaches to the main verb. <laughs> to the main verb. Bleh. Anyway, so for example, if I were to say the sentence uh, uh, suomea, which means I speak Finnish, the question form of that would be puhunko suomea. And that's uh, a little ko suffix that gets attached to the main verb, uh, puhun, which means I speak. Um, and that becomes the question. Um, uh, a nice little note, since Finnish is a vowel harmony language, um, that little suffix also participates in vowel harmony despite the fact that it's a clitic. So, for example, if you had the sentence, um, let's see, immeran, um, which means I understand, then to form the question, you would say immerankö, uh, where the uh, ko suffix has become kö, uh, participating in the vowel harmony of Finnish. Uh, so that's another example of something you can do to form yes-no questions. Along with the clitic strategy is the separate word strategy. This is something like you find in Arabic. So uh, this is where you have an entirely separate word usually coming uh, somewhere at the beginning that just takes an entire sentence, you don't change it at all, and you just add this word to the front and suddenly the declarative statement becomes a yes-no question. So for example, أَتَّكَلَمْ uh, بِالْعَرَبِيَةِ means uh, I speak Arabic. And if you wanted to ask, uh, do I speak Arabic? You would say, هَلْ uh, أَتَّكَلَمْ بِالْعَرَبِيَةِ same sentence, it just has this word hel in front, and that means this is a question. Um, very, very handy and uh, nice and easy to learn. Easier to learn than subject ox inversion, I'll tell you that. Ugh, what a nightmare. 
Another strategy is the tag question. You can form tag questions in most languages, like you can do it in English with a, a whole bunch of different types of things. So like, you know, if you say like, uh, he, is a, he is a handsome gopher, you could turn that into a question by saying, he is a handsome gopher, isn't he? Or he is a handsome gopher, no. A uh, little cutesy, but you can do it. Uh, some languages take this as their primary strategy, and um, it, it operates in some kind of uh, standard ways. Uh, a good example is Chinese, but since, uh, or Mandarin, but since I don't speak it, I'm not going to try to do an example in it. But uh, a kind of a fake example of that type of a strategy would be say, say something like, uh, your statement is, he likes fish. And you want to ask, does he like fish? You would say, he likes fish, doesn't like. Um, and usually that doesn't part is just some sort of a very small little negative particle. So it's just kind of like, you know, verb, no verb. Um, another thing would be like, you know, uh, you know, we go boating is a statement and the, qu and the uh, question uh, formed from that would be, uh, we go boating, good, no good. Where the good, no good just means like, should we or should we not? Uh, and it just becomes kind of like a standard um, tag that you add to the end of the sentence, and this is interpreted as a yes-no question. Something else I want to discuss that's fairly common is the cleft strategy. Um, if you look at something like French, uh, you might think it's doing one of two things. One, that it has a subject aux, aux inversion, which it does, um, uh, and then there's this other thing that happens. So for example, if you say, uh, je parle français, that means I speak French. The way that you would ask that as a yes-no question would be, est-ce que je parle français? Um, and if you just hear it, it sounds like, okay, this is something like Arabic. There's a little word in front that's just the yes-no question word, est-ce que? Uh, and you just put that in front, the rest of the sentence stays exactly the same, and it's the same thing as a statement, but as a yes-no question. And functionally, that is true. But if you open up that little uh, word at the beginning. Um, I mean, with, with your orthography, you can see exactly what it is, or at least what it was. Uh, we have the, the um, EST, which is uh, just pronounced E, but uh, in this context, it's pronounced S. Um, or not really, I guess the next part is pronounced S. Anyway, that's the verb, it means is. Then you have this little S, which is kind of uh, means that or it uh, in this context. And then the, the Q-U-E, the K, means uh, that. Um, and not uh, that as in a demonstrative, but the that and then something like, I told him that I couldn't come, that kind of a that. And so what this is saying, it's basically literally, is it that, and then the sentence follows. Um, Linguists have found that this happens a lot in languages. So where it looks like uh, maybe something was just a, a, a yes-no question word, in fact, it was a yes-no question cleft, and it just has moved up to the front and maybe shortened up. That's certainly what's happened here with French. It's, it was a cleft, it shortened up, it sounds like a word now. Uh, we know thanks to the orthography of French that it used to be something different. Um, uh, an open question that you should consider if you're creating a naturalistic language is how are you getting your initial question word? Um, does it come from something like, uh, well, if, that's actually where the question word in Dothraki comes from, or does it come from something like a fronted cleft like this that just shortened up over time? Um, they think that a lot of these initial question words actually uh, arose in just this way. Lastly, there are languages where you can uh, take a statement and turn it into a yes-no question simply by changing the intonation alone. This is a language like Spanish, so if you want to say something like um, uh, Tienes dos pájaros en la cocina. It's I have two birds in the kitchen, because why wouldn't you? If you wanted to turn that into a yes-no question, you'd say uh, Tienes dos pájaros en la cocina, like that where the intonation just kind of changes and you just know this is a question. There is no subject ox inversion in Spanish. There's no special question word. There's nothing there. You just do it in this way and you know it's a yes-no question. Um, many languages can do this as an optional strategy. So like we can do this in English. Um, you know, like uh, there are two birds in your kitchen or there are two birds in your kitchen, you know, you can do that in English, you can do it in a lot of languages, but in some languages, that's the only strategy for forming a yes-no question, so that's always an option that you can use. Finally, two notes to consider uh, as we wrap this up. 
Um, first, uh, there is a type of yes-no question that uh, you can always do by simply placing special emphasis on one of the words in the sentence. Uh, so, I don't know, if it's a sentence with multiple things in it, it would be something like, um, uh, I spoke to two fish yesterday. Um, you could take any uh, single one of those words and emphasize them and turn it into a yes-no question like, uh, I spoke to two fish yesterday. 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 You could even do, I spoke to two fish yesterday. You, you could do that too. Basically, you know, just take any one of those words and it's basically, all right, I'm asking you a question about this specific word in the sentence. Um, you know, I always want to hedge a little bit, but this type of strategy has been found for every language, period. It's just something that all languages can do. Very simple kind of like, okay, I'm focusing on this word as a word, so please pay attention to it, and I'm asking a question about it. All languages can do that. It's not like a, a primary uh, yes-no question formation strategy. The second note is that when forming yes-no questions, I mean, they're called yes-no questions, but don't think that means that you have to have a word that is a direct equivalent of yes or the direct equivalent of no. Plenty of languages have them, you know, English, Spanish, French, we've all got words for, for yes and no. Uh, but sometimes you can do other things. So for example, uh, in Finnish, one way that you can say yes to a question is just repeating the verb. So uh, something like if somebody asks you um, uh, you can answer and that means uh, so the first one is do you speak Finnish and the answer is I speak and that's just fine enough for an answer. Um, this is one uh, strategy in Finnish. Some languages have that as its only strategy for saying yes. Oh and the same goes for no. So um, if uh, answering that same question you could just say n. And N is not a word that means no in the way that our word no means no. N is actually the first person present tense conjugation of a negative auxiliary. So if you wanted to say say it all the way, you'd say like, you know, N uh, or is it N I'm still learning Finnish. Anyway, but um, that's, the, that's the negative part of it. Um, it's N for first person, et for second person, um, A for uh, third person singular, and so on and so forth. So it's like you say, it's like saying I don't, but uh, just as a verb. So that's uh, one strategy. Um, another strategy is to do something like um, to just have, uh, use your whatever auxiliary you have, um, like to be, for example, and make that your word for yes or no. Um, so if somebody asks you a question like, uh, you know, do you like going skeet shooting? No, the answer to that has to be no. But anyway, it's, uh, you, you would say, um, it is not. Or if you wanted to say yes, you would say it is. Usually this thing just conjugates as a singular verb. Um, and that can be a way, uh, to form a, a yes or no response. Very, very simple. Um, the point is that uh, just because you're creating these yes-no questions doesn't mean you have to have a word for yes or no. There are other strategies that you can use. You can probably think of others. Um, but of course, there's nothing wrong with any of them. You can still have um, you know, words for yes or no. It's very handy. Um, and I say that being <laughs> the speaker of a language that has words for yes or no, I'm a little biased, I guess. But yeah, anyway, so something to consider as you're making these things in your conlang. That's it for this episode. If you have a question you'd like for me to answer on the show, leave it in the comments or send me an email at djpquery at gmail.com. If you want to see more videos like this one, feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching. Say hi, my good boy. Say hi. That's you. Hi.